Now, if you're really in a poor insulin sensitive state or full blown insulin resistance to the point you might, uh, you know, you're leaning one step towards type 2 diabetes. I don't think it's that bad, but you don't consider yourself a bodybuilder on this side, but you're leaning towards the type 2 diabetes. Maybe go full keto. You drop all of your carbs. Vigorous Steve here. Let's say you're somewhere in the middle of the off season and you've been increasing your calories nice and steadily, getting stronger, increasing the workout intensity and gaining a significant amount of new muscle tissue in the process. But you're also getting a little too fat for comfort and you start to hold water in places that you didn't hold water before. And now you're contemplating bumping up the dose with another increment to facilitate more anabolism and increase metabolic rates with additional muscle tissue, allowing you to maybe even recomp on the same amount of calories that you were eating before on a lower dose that was making you fat. Now, before you increase the drugs, let me give you guys a little bit of a different strategy because it might simply mean that you're just losing insulin sensitivity. That's why you're gaining additional subcutaneous water. And there's always ways around it before increasing the dose further. And again, you're not at the end of the off season, so you can't really ride the anadrol or the anabol or superdrol gang train finishing off the off season with a bang protocol. You can't do that just quite yet. Because usually after that, you need to do a bit of a detox and give your liver a break. Again, orals require a little bit of a break. You didn't reach a real plateau yet. You're just slowly getting fat. So what can we do to resolve this? Well, first we have to look at the causes. Because it could be food intake or it could be drug selection. Now, when it comes to the drugs, I'm sure everybody knows by now that high dosages are you know, frequent exposure to moderate dosages of growth hormone. Let's say you're doing uh, two units of GH multiple times per day. And now GH is active in your system the majority of the day, let's say eight hours, 12 hours, maybe even 16 hours if you're doing frequent growth hormone administrations. That can cause insulin resistance by itself because growth hormone inhibits insulin substrate 1 and prevents insulin from working correctly. You know, glucose uptake will be slightly impaired. And it's the same with MK677, also known as ebutamorin, which stimulates the ghrelin receptors and raises appetite. And it also acts as a growth hormone secretagogue. And then it's, of course, the main reason why people use MK677. They want that additional growth hormone in the bloodstream. And marginally raising growth hormone concentrations 24-7 by taking MK677 can cause, you know, moderate to significant insulin resistance by itself. But poor dietary choices while you're running MK677 and it's boosting your appetite, that can compound an even worse insulin resistance. Now, if you're able to manage the appetite and you make very good dietary choices and you're not always glycogen loaded, you might be able to forgo the increase or the potential for insulin resistance when you're running MK677 but most people at one point or another experience insulin resistance when they're running MK677. Now, there's other drugs that can cause insulin resistance as well. They're not very common in the bodybuilding space during the off-season. Beta blockers, for example, and most of those are, you know, investigated in cases of type 2 diabetes, just like the thiazide diuretic medications to lower blood pressure and some of the statins. Now... In most cases with bodybuilders, you know, again, it's been studied in type 2 diabetes, but bodybuilders or people in the fitness industry are generally very physically active and they're not very subject to insulin resistance induced by beta blockers, thiazide medications, and which there are much better alternatives like telomersartan or tadalafil to keep your blood pressure under control. And for the statins, besides red yeast rice, I think ezetimibe or citrus bergamot are much better suitable to keep your lipids under control. And again, drug selection plays into that because if you're on a boatload of DHT derivatives, yeah, you might need a statin because your total cholesterol concentrations are to the moon. And that's what we're trying to prevent. So let's say you got yourself, yourself into the state of insulin resistance because of drug selection. It's very easy. Discontinue the drugs. 
that cause you insulin resistance or contribute to insulin resistance. Now, it's very easy selection. You maybe discontinue the drugs for one week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, at least until a point where insulin sensitivity is good again. And then we have to look at the diet. Now, the diet, especially during the off-season, when you have chronic caloric intake, especially carbohydrates, a lot of people reach a point where they are chronically saturated, the glycogen stores. And whether that's in the liver, the skeletal muscle, or even the brain, the glycogen stores are chronically saturated and insulin sensitivity goes down because skeletal muscle, the liver, and the brain don't really want to accept any more glucose because, again, glycogen stores are saturated and that lowers insulin sensitivity by itself. Now, at later stages of the off-season, it might be required to be chronically saturated. And again, you might be able to push yourself a little bit further with an anadrol, dianabol, or superdrol protocol. That's at the end of the off-season. You can still make very good progress being 90% glycogen loaded. It's a little bit of a balancing act. It might take a little bit experience to reach a point where you're not always glycogen loaded, but you have sufficient amount of glycogen stores available for a freaking awesome workout. And again, you can get the pump from a Gorilla Mode Nitrate and, you know, spike that with another scoop of glycerol or another scoop of creatine or, uh, you know, Ubiquino or, you know, injectable ATP or whatever pre-workout ritual you follow. You can always get insane amount of fullness during your off-season, even when you're not 100% glycogen loaded. But at least during the rest of the day or the majority of the day, you're still insulin sensitive. Now, if you find that hard to manage and you still are in this, you know, uh, glycogen overcompensated state all the time, you're losing insulin sensitivity. Even if you're not an MK677 or growth hormone, your body is just full with glycogen and it's time to take a mini diet. So... Same as what we did with the drugs, discontinuing, you discontinue the obscene amount of carbohydrates that you were running. You can reduce them by half. Maybe you're running 600 grams of carbs. Maybe it was only 500, maybe 300, right? Everybody loses insulin sensitivity or gets into an insulin resistant state, depending on their training intensity, how they process their carbohydrates, their metabolic rate. So whatever amount of carbohydrates you were eating somewhere in the middle of the off season, Reduce it by half. If you're eating 800 carbs, reduce it to 400. If you're eating 600 carbs, 300. 500 carbs, 250. 200 carbs, 100. Right? You just half it. You do that for two weeks. You add in the cardio. If you were not doing cardio before, I feel that you should be doing cardio during the off season so you can, you know, slowly creep up and train your heart to this ever-increasing body weight. I mean, that's the whole point of the off-season, right? Gaining new body weight. Hopefully, the majority of that is new muscle tissue. Some of that is going to be fat and water retention. But dropping your carbs in half, discontinuing the drugs that could potentially cause you insulin resistance, and adding in a little bit of cardio, within two weeks, insulin sensitivity will return with a vengeance, and then it's a good revenge of the insulin sensitivity because you'll be able to make a decent amount of progress on your previous diet. Because now the carbohydrates that you were eating previously that were spilling over into adipose tissue and causing water retention, now the insulin sensitivity is so good that all those carbohydrates are going back to the muscle. And without increasing the dose, you didn't lose any significant amount of muscle tissue in the meantime, even by lowering your overall caloric intake and dropping your carbohydrates in half, you didn't lose any strength, hopefully. Hopefully you can push further and, you know, ride out these two weeks of slight caloric restriction. You didn't lose any strength. You didn't lose any size. Maybe you lost a little bit of muscle fullness. But now that the insulin sensitivity has returned on the same amount of calories, same drug intake, you're still making gains. And you didn't need to bump up the drugs. And actually, you saved money in the process because you're eating less foods. And again, you didn't bump up the drugs. And you took a break from the growth hormone or the MK677 or whatever PED was contributing to the insulin resistance. Now, there's always a bit of a hack. And I know what you guys are going to ask me. What about metformin? Yes, it does work. But there's a caveat. Dropping the growth hormone and adding in the metformin will significantly reduce your serum IGF-1 concentrations 
by half or one third, or, you know, I've seen it drop below 100 nanograms per milliliter on my blood work and some of my clients' blood work after a week or two on 500 milligrams of metformin before bed. Is that worth losing the potential to increase insulin sensitivity? Because again, IGF-1 contributes to insulin sensitivity because IGF-1 and insulin can activate each other receptors and contribute to glucose uptake. So actually, IGF-1 is the one that contributes to insulin sensitivity as well. So you don't want to lower that too much by taking metformin. But then again, your caloric intake went down. Metformin is able to slow gastric emptying by slowing glucose release from the liver as well. But is it worth the reduction in IGF-1? Personally, I don't think so. But it surely is effective to speed up the effect of your mini diet in between stages of the off season. So there's something to say for it. I've done mini diets with metformin, 500 milligrams before bed and without metformin, and maybe replace that with 500 milligrams of berberine. And honestly, that got the job done just as well. But when I checked my serum IGF-1 concentrations at the end of this two week mini diet, they were higher compared to running metformin. But the insulin sensitivity returned just the same, and my off-season was able to progress on the same amount of calories and the same overall dose. So I would recommend 500 milligrams of berberine instead of 500 milligrams of metformin before bed. But again, you can make that decision all for yourself, because I don't know how bad the insulin resistance has got and uh, you know how much of a um, glucose spillover occurred. Now, if you're really in a poor insulin sensitive state or full blown insulin resistance to the point you might, uh, you know, you're leaning one step towards type 2 diabetes. I don't think it's that bad, but you don't consider yourself a bodybuilder on this side, but you're leaning towards the type 2 diabetes. Maybe go full keto. You drop all of your carbs. Take the 800 carbs or the 600 or the 500 or the 200 carbs out completely. Maybe increase your protein intake so you don't have this astronomical drop in overall caloric intake. You don't have to bump up the fat because it takes about a week or two to get into a ketogenic state. So it'll be a ketogenic diet without you actually reaching deep ketosis because you're only going to do it for two weeks. So let's just call it for what it is. You're going to do a temporary no carb mini diet. You don't have to increase your fat intake because by the time you're in ketosis, you're probably reintroducing the carbohydrates again anyway. But you know, in most cases, your protein intake is not that stellar at middle stages of the off season. Again, because, you know, carbohydrates act as a protein sparing macro. So if you're eating 600 carbs, 800 carbs, your protein intake is probably low, let's say 200, 250 grams of protein. And in that case, you bump up your protein with 50%. So the carbs are coming out, you're compensating a little bit of the calories by increasing your protein intake by 50%. So let's say you're on 200 grams of protein, you bump it up to 300, and 250 grams of protein, you bump it up to what? 375 grams of protein, maybe even 400 grams of protein for two short weeks. No carbs, maybe metformin. Again, if you're in a poor insulin sensitive state, maybe you combine, you know, maybe you go wild and you combine 500 milligrams of metformin with 500 milligrams of berberine and you hit that insulin sensitivity from three angles no carbs, metformin, and berberine. Again, the choice is yours. Sometimes it's required. After two weeks, insulin sensitivity should return. You reintroduce the carbohydrates and you start growing again. You just go back on the previous diet that got you into this uh, insulin-resistant state. And then last but not least, full fasting. And then you only need one week to restore insulin sensitivity because now your caloric intake is so low that the insulin sensitivity returns very, very fast. You get into ketosis within two or three days. It's not easy. It's not for everybody. You might think that you're going to lose muscle in the process. And again, if you're worried about losing muscle during a fast or a ketogenic diet, I hate to say it, but you probably don't have so much muscle to lose anyway. So why worry about it? You're going to lose glycogen stores. You're going to lose water retention, intestinal mass, your body weight is going to drop. You can take pictures before and after. Maybe your body weight goes down with like 5 to 10%. Don't worry, that will return with a vengeance. Also, take it from me, I've done it many, many, many times before. And while you fast, you might as well deload, take a week off from the gym, 
And instead of, uh, you know, wasting two weeks on a mini diet, you deload, you rest, you don't eat, you don't train, and insulin sensitivity returns a week later, maybe five and a half days, you know, almost a week. You fast from Sunday evening to Saturday morning. Five and a half days, no training. And you continue with your off season nice and steadily. Thank you so much for watching. I hope it was helpful, guys. I hope I offered you a couple solutions to finding yourself in a state where you're getting fat, gaining water weight, and you're contemplating bumping up the dose. Um, but you can try this first. Again, you will save some money and your health will be in a better state because of it. Thank you so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorousteve.com shop. If you're looking for personalized advice, you can find the rates to my services in the services section. Contact me directly. If you're interested, you can do that on Instagram. Also, follow me there at vigorousteve. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. No insulin resistance or loss of insulin sensitivity right here. Because I'm always in ketosis and I only have carbs one time per week. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.